Hello, everyone, and welcome to Generation the Podcast, the audio companion to the HBO Max original series, Generation. I am Gigi Good, famous American drag queen. <laughs> and I'm Wembley Stool, editor in chief of Them. Gigi, it is so nice to see you again. So nice. Oh gosh, I, I'm I'm overwhelmed. Truly, you can't you can't <laughs> tell, but um, I am shaking in my boots. Um, but it's <laughs> it's really great to be here again with Daniel, Zelda Barnes, you two. Y'all are the co-creators of Generation and. Lukita Maxwell, we have you back. Hello, hello, On the podcast. (laughs) Finally. Hello, hello. But before we get into truly the intros, Gigi, do you want to, you know, take us back and and walk us through episode nine? Girl, buckle up, sister, because it's a doozy. Listen, in episode nine, we're back. We're back with the gang. We're back with the girls. We are back into the interiorities of this incredible group of teens but you know in this episode first up we have chester's extremely extremely awkward date with Bo that has too too many <laughs> vomit moments so obviously chester is sour riley is more sour as the vitriol between her parents intensifies Nathan is also sour because his mom, she tried to get him to confess the gay way. And and he tells the pastor that he has a boyfriend, which is obviously a lie. He does not have a boyfriend. And Delilah is sour because her crush has a crush on Naomi and Naomi won't stop talking about it. So everyone currently at the beginning of this episode and throughout had just has a whole pity party for themselves. And then, you know, we kind of end on an incredible fake kiss between Nathan and his fake boyfriend, Chester. Quite, quite a lot has happened. It's a big one. A lot, a lot has happened. And like always, there's a lot to get into. But for me, I think that I I had to hit pause after the date because it just brought me back. Like <laughs> that day, I was like, been I've been there. here. I've 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 been here. I've I've done this. I feel this. Like I yeah. can feel the hair on the back of my neck rising through every single moment <laughs> of that date. Haven't haven't you know ended up covered in in vomit, thankfully, but emotionally, Ew. maybe metaphorically, yes. Um, but Tell I am me. again. I'm just so glad to be back. I'm I'm so thrilled to be reunited with y'all and I think we need to find out you know why and how all of this happened and so without further ado welcome back to the program Zelda hi hi Zelda and we are also so lucky once again to also have Daniel Barnes here we love Daniel over here thank you so much for being here Daniel kidding thank you so much I I love you guys so much (laughs) (laughs) And last but not least, we are so pleased to welcome back Lukita Maxwell, who stars as Delilah. Hey, guys. Woo, woo. All right. So shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Let's go. In this episode, we learn that some time has passed since the last episode. So Delilah has had a bit more time to process the birth. And it's clear. It's so clear I think even from the beginning of, of when we see uh, Lukita, your character again, that she's different now. She's had this huge life change and, and transformation, but we hear kind of like right off the bat that it's still a secret to some of the people that she's close to. And I would love to play that clip at the party um, where she's talking to Riley about how, quite frankly, not everything is everyone's business. Roll the tape. My parents don't, um, no. Oh. I don't know, we live in this world where it's all like, you have to tell everything to everyone all the time. And maybe it's just, I don't know, not actually always the best thing. Look, I I agree with this sentiment, but before getting too deep into it, Lukita, could you tell us what your interpretation is of what's happening to Delilah here and and what she's letting us into? Yeah, I think she's got a lot on her mind. I think yeah. that the <laughs> the in the, since the last time we saw her, she's tried to start processing 
a little bit of what happened, what happened in her body. She's trying to figure out how to be a normal teen again and what a normal teen means to her. She was never one to fit into that box of what a normal teen means, but now she's trying to find any sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. When she's saying that, she's also thinking about Cooper a little bit and her crush on Cooper and feeling like she's betraying Naomi, her best friend, a little bit. Yeah. But also like toying with that idea going back and forth. Should I tell her? Should I not tell her? And in this moment when she's talking to Riley, I think she's leaning on the maybe I shouldn't say anything and just swallow my feelings and kind of Mm. figure my own stuff out on my own. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember when I was a teenager being so confused about what the difference between a secret and a lie is. And when is one bad and when is one good? And I think it's really Mm. hard to grapple with. Like, I think Delilah doesn't know whether to tell Naomi her real feelings about Cooper, but she's partly doing it to protect Naomi, you know? And so it's like this lie that's like kind of for a good purpose. And she's sort of doing the same thing with her parents. And I think it's, it's, you know, this was sort of one of the things that this episode, in fact, this whole block is really exploring is like secrets and lies and the ways that they can be so confusing and sometimes good and sometimes bad. And I think the other thing that Delilah says here that's so critical is like she doesn't want to be defined as a teen mother. And, you know, and that's one of the things that this show is dealing with all across the board is like when you put a label on yourself, when you identify in a certain way, does that define you forever? And whether that label is like, you know, your gender or sexuality identification. Like, I just, you know, that's one of the things that she's sort of confused about. Like, I don't want to be defined in in this way. I don't want everyone else to define me for me. I think that's a really interesting perspective here, especially when it's put up against this idea also of of secrets, because you could you could say, you know, labeling yourself, declaring yourself as something is the opposite of a secret. But both labeling and, you know, keeping things to yourself can be seen as as self-preservation and actually quite affirming either way you look at it. Yeah, no, and I'll just also say, like, I think, you know, as I probably talked about way too much in the last podcast, we really wanted to stay away from um, tropes of secrecy and shame yeah. and, like, regret in, in adoption storylines because, yeah, and, and I mean, by secrets, I mean, like, the sort of traumatic effects of keeping it, things secret because we just weren't interested in our experience of adoption, you know, is has, has been so joyful mm-hmm. and miraculous, and I think we really wanted to focus on that. And so the other thing I think that Delilah is doing here is she wants to be the author of her own story. Yeah. And so she wants to tell it in the way that she wants to tell it. But, yeah, that means keeping a secret, which is just an interesting and complicated thing. But I think that's the power of choice. That's the power of choice. And it does, it also makes me think about, you know, Delilah's crush. And Luke, I would love your your perspective here too, because she has a big choice to make, Delilah. She has to choose in some ways a little bit between going after what she wants for herself and and this friend group that does seem kind of stronger than ever with, with, you know, the necklaces now and you see her, you know, kind of holding it in a lot of scenes. And I'm curious where, you know, you acting this out, bringing this to life, um, how you've been processing that. (laughs) Uh, When we were shooting Nine, we shot it when we came back from, I think, uh, the holidays. And we were all just so excited to be back on set and so yeah. excited to be together. And so I feel like that I had that feeling of being like, oh my God, I'm back with my girls. Like we're all here, <laughs> we're all together. And the three of us on and off screen have gone through a lot of stuff and even just acting out the scenes together have like really gone through it and have always been there to support each other. Nathania and Chloe, I Mm, mwah, mwah, mwah. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Love y'all. Um, but yeah, I think she's, uh, yeah, just very, very confused, very torn. Uh, there's this really cute boy that she likes, but she's also, I think, confused about liking somebody because the last time she liked somebody, something crazy happened to her. <laughs> um, and she, she, last time she went for it. And on the other side, uh, her two friends that she's finally 
found uh, she's been kind of not she's kind of been isolated from the show and uh, in the show until she found Naomi and Ariana and she just values their friendship so much. So, yeah, well, that is that's so, 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 so clear. And I love hearing the little BTS, you know, <laughs> friendship moments, too. Love that. Let's talk a little bit about the romantic zone of it all. I'm referring specifically to Chester and Bo. And this is the first episode where we see a sort of traditional date. I guess, I mean, if you want to call their date a traditional date. But um, I just mean that in the sense that it's not just a hookup. It's not just like a a little slow burn uh, between friends. It's, you know, a cute regular date at the skating rink where Chester is dressed in head to toe rainbow pride gear on accident and is uh, very <laughs> open about his his uh, big expectations and you know on top of all of that slips and falls on vomit Bo vomits all over the table I like I we we need to move on from the vomit conversation but before we do <laughs> I need to know from Zelda and Daniel why did you put us through the unending awkwardness of this day big why big why <laughs> um, we had so much fun writing that and talking about that in the writer's room. Um, it was just like we wanted because, you know, you would expect that Chester would set up, would just know how to set up like a perfect date. And so we had so many conversations about how to do something kind of unexpected with this moment and how to make it maybe not that perfect for Chester or his date. And um, just to have him kind of like have such high expectations and have it go kind of horribly wrong. And so we had so many conversations about like all the ways that it could go wrong. I feel like it brought me back, like I mentioned at the top of this episode, to just some of the most gut-wrenchingly like terrible moments. I won't even call them dates. I just feel like I have to call them moments um, in time. And I'm curious if like when writing when writing this episode and throwing out every single possible thing that could happen, like what, what was that like? And, and what kinds of things were being thrown out? Do I tell them Zelda about the other? I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember what they all were. No, I want to know if I should give away the, 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 this is so embarrassing, but what, what, um, there's a little, this is another, I guess, sort of semi interesting behind the scenes, like tidbit, but when I was in grad school and like so broke and looking for temp jobs, <laughs> Zelda's covering her mouth like she can't believe I'm about to tell this story. <laughs> but I uh, signed up to be a party entertainer and I showed up at a kid's birthday party. Oh my God. <laughs> as Aladdin. And uh, a number of the things that those kids scream at that pirate in the scroll skating ring were things that were screamed at me, like your teeth wow. are yellow and are you are you Jewish? Oh um, man. So there was some, you know, personal exorcism that was happening in writing, but you know, they say write what you know put it on and the page. Up your veins yep. and let it put it all on the page. So I did. But I think we were just also really interested. Like Tester is such a as a character is somebody who's he's he's really really complicated as we've discussed before and i think it was interesting to us to take this character who in some contexts can be so um poised and so confident and put him in a situation you know when he's with sam it's different right because he's testing boundaries he almost knows he's never going to get away with it on Mm -hmm. some level and here there's somebody his age that could actually be like as he says real boyfriend material and it was we were just interested to see what happens when chester really wants something and then like it starts to fall apart so his like he compensates by becoming just too extra and then experiences um genuine pain afterwards We're talking about episode nine of the HBO Max series, Generation. And we're going to get into a lot more after a quick break. Hey everyone, welcome back. We are talking to Generation creator Zelda Barnes, director of Generation Daniel Barnes, and Lukita Maxwell, who stars as Delilah. 
let's definitely talk about this steamy kiss between Chester and Nathan, um, which definitely uh, sparked some concern for some people in that scene. Um, you know, kiss scenes are political, I think, on all fronts, and gay kissing scenes have been so contested. So I just please tell us the thinking behind the shooting and editing of this scene, because, you know, the people who are in the background watching and what that kind of represented for the scene and how that represents the relationship moving forward, you know, also sex scenes in the series, just more generally. Yeah, I mean, you know, part of the thing was, I mean, the episode is called Deep Fake. And so Mm -hmm. part of it is just, you know, was exploration of lies and where that brings you. And so in the seen before when they have the X-Files viewing party and then Jay says the uh, line about truth that I, of course, I can't remember. That's like what sparks Nathan in that moment to think about, wait a second, like here's a lie that that Chester could maybe help with and um, proposes it. And, you know, it's really complicated. And I think, you know, yeah, I don't think I'm giving anything away, but it becomes an interesting thing about this, how this unfolds between them and, who is culpable in this? And, you know, they each have things that they sort of want from each other, but it's also kind of fun. And um, when we first wrote the script, we actually put like six action lines for this kiss. We knew we wanted it to be long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we have this phenomenal intimacy coordinator that um, Lukita can talk about as well, uh, Rachel, who guides us with all of these things. And when when we were shooting that kiss, it was, you know, it was interesting. We've discovered some things about kissing on screen. And um, I hope this isn't too graphic and weird for people, but like the importance of actually seeing some tongue mm. um, mm-hmm. in order to really sell a kiss and seeing the kind of a tongue totally. going kind of a mouth because we did not want to back off. And when we were editing the episode, questions came up about the length of the kiss mm. and whether the the kiss was overstaying its welcome. And I think <laughs> what Zelda and I felt was, A, it is really fucking hot. I, that is a hot <laughs> kiss, okay? B, it's great for these characters. Like, it unfolds in acts. There are three acts to that kiss, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and Nathan, you see him surprised, you see him enjoying it, and then act three, like, he is passionate and in love, and it makes it complicated. And the other thing is, Gigi, as you mentioned, is the history of gay kisses on screen. They are have so traditionally been chased fast. Yeah. You have, you know, not queer actors doing them and then trying to do them quickly mm, or totally. overcompensating by, like, eating the other person's face off. Like, they just don't <laughs> look real. And I think... For us to have two openly queer actors having a queer kiss. And so when it came like, do we shave off some seconds? I think Zelda and I were like, no, no, this kiss should go on and on and on and on and on. And it should make up for like all of those decades of like short, chaste, same sex kisses. So we want that MTV Best Kiss Award <laughs> and we want it bad. You have my vote. I don't know where to send it, but you have you have my vote. It was really beautiful to see. And I think I hope it sets a precedent for all all future kisses to come. If it's not that, I don't want to I don't want to see it. Not interested. Hats off to y'all. Um, but I am curious because, I mean, thinking of a different kind of, of intimacy and Daniel, you shouted out, you know, that Lukita knows what it's like to kind of bring something like this to life. But a different kind of intimacy to me was also like that birthing scene and like what it kind of took to go through that and and bring that to life. And I'd like to hear about that experience too, because I don't think we got too much into it, but then launching back into that mirror shot we got of Delilah after we we saw all of those super, super, you know, high energy, high emotion birthing scenes and then cut to the quiet, really intimate, um, you yeah. know, reflection of, of Delilah. And I would love to hear, Lukita, your perspective on that true, like kind of juxtaposition there. From my perspective shooting it, when we first started working in the bathroom, Rachel uh, Flesher, our intimacy coordinator, was incredible. She was talking through with me all of these breathing patterns mm-hmm. fit where I would be f- feeling physical pain ha- and wow. she, I would be like sitting on the ground in the tub with her like rehearsing the scene mm-hmm. um, moments before we shot and then she'd be like, move your pelvis like two inches this way it'll just make it like it'll make you feel this much more in it and wow I had to go home and 
decompress for mm. like a day or two after shooting those scenes. And Rachel would text me and check up on me and be like, here's a breathing exercise. Light a candle, associate a scent with comfort. I can't imagine what it's like to actually go through childbirth <laughs> because I I was kind of going through it for a day after um, shooting those scenes. Um, but yeah, the especially in four episode four, when the actual birth happens, like you said, Wembley, it's like a very chaotic, very loud, very emotional mm -hmm. uh, scene. And comparing that to episode nine, where she has this kind of moment of peace with herself and her body before school. She's going back to school, going to see her friends. Right. And it's not a regretful moment at all. It's not mm -mm. a... She doesn't dislike her body. She's admiring the scars that she has and mm. she's content with the habit that she's living in and mm. um, trying to figure out how she can live in this body and still be a normal teen and find what that means to her. And now she's thinking about a boy all the time. So this is what's <laughs> on her mind. So. <laughs> yeah. The wishes she wasn't. Of all the characters, Delilah really wishes she was not crushing on a boy. So yeah. much so. Oh, my God. Not a cis straight man. That moment also is really interesting. I love how you fill that moment, Lukita. I think it's so incredible when you're standing in front of the mirror. I just, again, you know, like what we talked about in Eight, those, these, these private silent moments that you fill out as an actor that are so extraordinary and so rich and so layered are incredible to watch. And it was just as an Easter eggy kind of thing, also a bit of a callback to the pilot when Greta yeah. is standing in front of the mirror because we kind of wanted to kick off this second block with a callback to some moments in the pilot. I mean, another little Easter egg was when um, Riley starts to open up to her parents, to Greta, and gets interrupted um, mm -hmm. as everybody runs it in the pilot. There was that moment when Greta's opening up to Riley about her mom and gets interrupted. And so we were just kind of yeah, like looking for totally. ways to kind of like thread it back together. But like Zelda said, it's just so interesting to see like where Riley and Greta have come to in the, like such a reversal in their relationship. Let's talk about Riley for a second in this episode because, you know, we haven't really talked about her a lot and a lot, a lot is happening to her. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing right now is her mom's inner child room, which is to me just like so out of left field and like the last thing I was expecting. So... I, I just kind of want to know the the inspiration, like what what brought about uh, of all the problems for her mom to have, why the inner child? Well, that one again, there's a bit of an autobiographical thing because um, Ben uh, Zelda's other dad and producer on this thing has had a family friend whose wife actually like built herself <laughs> a, a house for her inner child. I don't know. It came up in a writers' room one day, and we were all just like obsessed and and couldn't stop <gasps> thinking about it. I thought it looked like fun. <laughs> It did look like fun. Don't get me wrong. I would spend some time in that damn room. But I, 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 I mean, it's like, that's crazy that that's a real thing that happens oh, to yeah, real people. Oh, yeah, it's totally a real thing. But it also was, you know, we just thought it was interestingly so traumatic for Riley and yeah. for somebody who, like, values her space. And when you are in her room in that first block and it's so beautiful and she's created her dark yeah. room, we're just, like, thinking about, like, what a violation it would be for her. And, you know, you asked about Riley we're getting the sense that like there are some mental health issues that are going to be unfolding for Riley. Oh my God. Yeah. And, 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 and they, and they do. And I think that's one of the things that's really, uh, that we're excited about in the second block. I think, you know, like speaking from the older generations perspective, like one of the things that's so interesting about like Gen Z is their openness about, um, sexuality but also their openness about mental health and it's so interesting yeah. when we when i sit around and i listen to the cast talking and they're talking about like oh i was diagnosed with this and now i'm on this meds but i'm going off those meds and like those were things that like people were not talking about when i was in high school or right. like sexuality they were really shrouded in secrecy and shame and so it was it's interesting and zelda really wanted us to kind of go down this road and, and i'm excited that we are going down this road to sort of explore what happens with 
you know, Riley and some of her mental health stuff. And it felt like we needed a really traumatic beginning to it. And so it was like her mom has to take over her room. She's got to <laughs> turn into this inner child thing and like kick that off. I mean, as light and, and fresh and childish as this room is, it is very dark. It feels very dark, very shrouded, like you said. But it's it's interesting that Riley is almost taking on that narrative of not letting people in kind of like how you said when you were in in high school she's kind of taking that on she's not telling anybody I don't think she has any intention on telling anybody what's going on but it does feel like she just wants someone to know yeah you hit the nail on the head yeah (laughs) well you said that there's a lot to come for for Riley and I would love to hear from from all of your perspectives as we embark on on this second block without spoiling anything, you know, what you kind of feel is next for everyone? What kind of defines some of the things that we're going to see through the second block? We definitely do explore mental health um, and issues of mental health a lot more in this block. Um, something that's very important to me. It's something that's very important to the lot of, a lot of the cast. Um, so that was really exciting to get to kind of explore all of those issues in this block too. And also, In our block one, we kind of explore a lot of relationships between two people. Um, We kind of have the Riley Greta relationship and we have Nathan and Chester and we have Chester and Sam. And in block two, we kind of get into some more groups of three, some more trios, some more like Mm. circles. (laughs) We're going to have some triangles. We love triangles. (laughs) Yes, we love a triangle. (laughs) Yeah. Also, uh, female friendship, too. I think, you know, yeah. I, I love that moment when um, when you open up the helix from Ariana. I'm talking to Lakita directly. <laughs> but, like, I love that moment when Delilah opens up the necklace from Ariana and is like, I love this more than life itself. And I think um, there are some, there's some interesting and complicated explorations of uh, female friendship yeah. um, to come. Absolutely. Because, you know, the thing about shows about teenagers is it's actually in some ways interestingly hard to explore relationships that are friendships that are non-romantic and this is the thing that zelda kept reminding us in the in the uh, writer's room she's like all of these shows are like all about romance she's like but really like so many people have never date or they're like crushing on this one person or they're in the same relationship for four years or or like you're not even thinking about romance because you're just like bored or you're hanging out with your friends. And so she kept kind of like pushing us back to like exploring complications and conflict and joy between friends. And I love that we get to do that within this show. Listen, y'all, Wembley and I have become attached to this show. We are attached to this cast and the, the characters. I am like, I don't know why I can't, I just am beaming with pride for all of you. I'm so excited to see what is to come. And I, I really want to thank you all so much, Dan, Zelda, and Lukita for being here. I love y'all. Love you. Thank you, Gigi. I'm I'm so excited to see the journey that every single character is going to go on through the rest of the season. But in the meantime, we will be back with more BTS gems and exclusive generation analysis next week and every week until we run out of episodes. So thank you all so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Wembley. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye, y'all. Generation the Podcast is a production of HBO Max and iHeartRadio, hosted by us, Gigi Good and Wembley Sewell. The podcast is produced and written by Phoebe Unter, written and researched by Sierra Kaiser, and engineered, edited, and mixed by Matt Stillo. It's executive produced by Ethan Fixell. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Generation the Podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, be sure to watch the series itself on HBO Max. Thanks for listening.